morning, everyone. Uh, so I, my name is Renee Corner-Thomas. I'm the immediate past president of the New Zealand Society of Animal Production. And it's my really great pleasure this morning to introduce to you the recipient of the New Zealand Society of Animal Production Living Legends Address. Um, there was no collusion, uh, honestly, but the same recipient has also received the award for the uh, levy oration, which Warren will um, describe. Uh, just briefly, the Living Legends Award is a recognition of a distinguished career and an opportunity for that researcher to uh, speak on whatever they like. So hopefully you enjoy the oration. Thanks, Renee. Yes, it is um, a two for the price of one, and it's entirely appropriate. Uh, the Levy Oration uh, commemorates the contributions to the sector of uh, Bruce Levy, and I touched upon him in my presidential address yesterday. Suffice to say that uh, he has had a huge impact on the development of pastoral agriculture. Um, previous Levy uh, orators for the New Zealand Grasslands Association, uh, again, um, really significant people in the industry. Uh, and uh, uh, just a few of them uh, here, uh, Garden, Hay, Morton, uh, Holmes, Richard Green, Stephen Goldson, Corey Matthew, uh, Liz Wedderburn, and many of those presentations are available to, uh, to see from the um, Grasslands website, so uh, I invite you to go and have a look at some of those. Um, but today's uh, recipient of both the Living Legends Award and of the uh, Levy Oration uh, is uh, Peter Fennessy. Um, Peter uh, was a GM of, uh, of AgriSearch's Invermay campus from 92 to 97 uh, before he left to start Abacus Bio, which clearly has gone from strength to strength. Um, and if you look at some of the brief biographical details from the website on Peter, um, he's really focused on the practical application of scientific developments bridging science and business. His contribution is recognised internationally. He's worked in Australia, uh, in the UK, in Canada, in Brunei, among others. Um, he has received the, uh, actually, that's not quite true, I think, I need to get this right. He is an officer of the New Zealand Order of Merit, which he received for services to agricultural science and business. Um, we are very much looking forward to seeing what Peter has to say this morning. So please join me in uh, welcoming Peter to the stage. Um, Thanks, Renee. Uh, thanks, Renee. Thanks, Warren. And um, it's an extraordinary, frankly, humbling experience to be here. Um, I certainly got a, a, a very great surprise when um, Jo Kerslake um, asked me to come and have a coffee with her, and she told me they were going to do it. And then I got a, a call or something from Renee, and and I, no, I got a letter, an email or something, and I said, to, and I rang her up and said, oh, I'm terribly embarrassed to tell you that I've actually got another reward from, oh, she said, we know, oh, I actually know that. So I said, oh, that's a relief. In that case, you are going to get two for the price of one, or, or one for the price of two. You can make your own, you can, after it's all finished, you can work out what you think. So, um, in starting this, uh, thank you to um, uh, NZ. NZGA uh, and and two NZSAP for both these awards and um, uh, as I said I was very surprised and to me both organisations have been an incredibly important part of my of my uh, personal career and um, have had a massive impact I think on New Zealand agriculture um, and on discovery and I think that's really important and and about getting stuff out there into the industry where it can be used. Um, I'm not going to refer to any living people in this talk because I've, by name because I've worked with far too many and I'd be sure to miss them out for, obvi for obvious reasons. However, I am going to acknowledge one person, that's my uh, wife and life partner, Mary, um, who's been an extraordinary uh, part of my life for the last 50 plus years. Um, and the, so the way I look at it, and I'm talking to this now, um, I've been very privileged to have two careers. Um, one in research, which, uh, as Warren said, I um, left in 1997, about 25 years in research, and then did a couple of years consulting on my own, and then we formed Abacus Bio in, uh, in late 2000. 
and Abacus Bio has gone from strength to strength. So in a sense, this is a talk about a, re a reflection, but also it's a talk about really a, almost a handover to another generation, really, in some ways. So some of what I've been involved in, obviously been involved in the sheep industry, heavily involved in the deer industry, uh, heavily involved in Abacus Bio, and I don't think any talk that I give without a mention of a thoroughbred or a racehorse would be quite complete. So you'll get a little bit about that. But these pictures here all have meaning. Um, the, the two deer publications are two publications that I was involved in editing. One's the Biology of Deer Production, which was a conference we held in 1983, um, uh, Alan May. And this was really, a, a, this was the first time we really brought together people from the farming industry in deer internationally and the people in wildlife biology. So we learned a, hum a huge amount. Um, and that led to a, that conference and now still goes every four years. Um, and the other one was the uh, Journal of Heredity article on interspecies hybridisation. And that was inspired by the work we did with deer. And you get a little bit of reflection on that. And then, obviously, for the last 20 odd years, uh, Abacus Bio has and continues to be an incredibly important part of my life. So I'm going to talk a little bit, there are three sort of themes really, some reflections, some learnings, and a bit about the future. My reflections really fit into three categories around uh, curiosity, applications, and people. So curiosity, my curiosity, I've been a pretty curious person, uh, the, I suppose biology, variation, evolution, genetics. Uh, applications, making stuff practical. And people, different people, different expertise, different brains. That to me has been an incredibly, part of, uh, incredibly important part of how I sort of think and how I do things. When I was a kid, 10, 11, 12, 13, I bred budgies. I learned a huge amount, which I'll talk about. Then uh, when I was a teenager, I worked on uh, farms um, when I was about 13 or 13. Um, and I worked on relatives farms because I was pretty interested in farming and agriculture. And then in 1966, I went to Lincoln. So what I learned from breeding budgies, and I can now look back and say this was an extraordinarily learning event because I learned a lot about biological variation. Um, and biological variation is at the heart of a lot of what I, how I think now and how I do things. And the big, the, the really thing I remember well, because these pairs, you, you put them in a cage with pairs, and the variation between pairs and the number of chicks they reared, I well remember one year that I had a pair, of, uh, a pair of birds that reared 13 chicks in two clutches down to those that reared none, one or two. Huge lesson in, in what goes on in biological variation. Breeding was fun and selling birds paid the bills. If costs were greater than revenue, I had to find cash elsewhere. So I grew up in Dunedin and so that was a paper run. And I remember one, I had a magnificent year for breeding and I was gonna make a fortune, but the price crashed. And if I remember correctly, the price of seed doubled as well. Taught me two things about biology, and it taught me one extraordinary thing about farming. Everything, there's always something in biology that's conspiring. And you can either, sometimes you get it right, and sometimes it won't work. And genetics was mostly a mystery, but I knew about dominance and recessives, and that inbreeding was bad. What I saw on farms, and I remember one of my um, relatives, uh, one of the really early people who, used, who did border Lester Romney's and border Lester Romney um, in the 60s. And they were, they were much bigger, and the, and the, uh, and the, U, uh, and, and the first cross ewes had, much, had far more lambs. It was a dramatic, and I remember being quite impressed by that. And then another uh, relative had another, um, my uncle, had a uh, poultry farm and th that he, his revelation was turning on the lights in the morning and getting more eggs. That was a revelation. And that made me, th that, these are things you learn at the time. And you don't sort of realize how important they are till later on. What I saw as a student, I think the, what I, at Lincoln, farms, crossbreeding, selenium, variation within the herd, over the fence uptake, um, when I was, a, I remember working on a farm in Southland in the late 60s, and the striking thing was there that all grass wintering was coming in, getting rid of crops in the winter, 
and how it caught on really quickly, watching people, um, how, how people saw what the neighbours were doing and trying it out. And Lucerne and Systems, I think the Ashley Dean um, experience with uh, Prof Jim Stewart was extraordinary because that was where I saw a systems and really started to appreciate how systems fitted into how systems could be used. And then more impact of crossbreeding um, with Prof Ian Coop and Vern Clark. So what did I learn working with animals? And this is a this quote is a sort of a combination of two people. One's a horse trainer. And I can't remember where the other one came from. But it's like working with animals. They can't talk, so we have to listen very carefully. I think that's a, an extraordinarily pertinent way of thinking about working with animals. So now on to research. I came, uh, I spent a few months at Invermay in 1971, 72, and then I came back to Invermay after a PhD in, at the end of 1975, and I started working in research, genetics and breeding for reduced fat, because at the time there was a massive overfatness problem in New Zealand, and um, nutrition, and there it was really the focus there was around some, how we could make a difference easily. And in deer, nutrition, genetics, breeding, antlers and growth, seasonality, reproduction. This is an example of a learning thing which I think has been profound. This is a, a, an example of what I think in two sheep fed methionine, a post-ruminal methionine, and it was a, a part of my PhD actually, but it was increasing post-ruminal methionine. I had two sheep and they did completely different things in terms of their response on really poor quality diets to methionine. One's intake went down and one's intake went down, up, but it was repeatable. So that taught me a lot about thinking about variation, variation between animals, but the repeatability of, of a trait, and it's had quite a big influence in how I think about genetics. In deer, um, now to deer. Um, and I think this is, I learned a huge amount of info working in the deer program and in the sheep program too actually, working with farmers. And the early, deer, the early deer research was driven by the practical needs of the industry. The industry was a fledgling industry, it needed practical, we needed practical knowledge quickly, especially in nutrition, reproduction, antler growth, health. And hence there was a, quite a big emphasis on seasonality and then later genetics and breeding. And I've got two or three little things here that I think uh, I'm going to talk about just in relation to deer. The first is seasonality and live weight. We all know deer are seasonal. Uh, all, all, all ruminants are actually seasonal originally. We just breed some of the seasonality out of them. But deer go back and you start to think about what seasonality really is. So over winter, this is actually an animal indoors. An animal over winter, no weight gain. This is, a, this is a, three, a three to four year old stag, I think. And the intake rapidly increases over spring and summer. Um, as a live weight gain rapidly increases over spring and summer. And then, in come the rut, the weight pours off them and you get a bit of a recovery over in early winter. But they lose weight and they lose fat. Now I'm gonna go through and look at the intake here and just bring them, tie them together. Because I think this is really interesting. The feed intake, year after year, increased from the week of the 13th of August, seven weeks after, seven weeks after the winter solstice. Fascinating thing in its own right. But year after year, that's when intake... So from farmer point of view, you had to have feed available. They, they needed to have, make sure that they had more feed available and, uh, at that time. And then... Um, there's a very, as you can see, the intake in the lower part of it, the intake in the lower part, the intake drops off dramatically at the rut. But something else happens, very strange. Just before the rut, um, stags pour on weight. Could be anything between 5 and 20 kilos in this passive period, be uh, just before the rut. When they are, in fact, their intake is declining. So you ask why. Well, I'd say it was dishonest advertising. It's actually pouring water into their neck. That's actually what they do. They, they pump up the muscles of their neck with water just prior to the rut. And you can work out the calculation, and it works out that most of this virtually is water. So they stack it in. So you can see this stag here, fantastic mane and everything, roaring his head off, as they do. 
And, and, but in that, that neck is massive, but actually that increase in that pre-rut period is actually due to water. So, how, so that's an androgen or a testosterone responsive muscle. I think the next bit is that um, the f work we did on feed intake and requirements um, was really important, had a massive industry impact. Because in the late 70s, there was a sort of general feeling that deer didn't need much over winter, both hinds and stags, because they didn't put on any weight. I'm afraid the extrapolation from weight gain to intake is erroneous, completely erroneous. And we actually found that the, we compared indoor and outdoor feeding, and the feed requirements outdoors were 50% higher than those indoors for, for maintenance. So animals doing the same amount, doing nothing in terms of weight gain, ate 50% more outdoors. Huge impact. It really highlighted the value of shelter and the critical importance of having good feed available over winter. And the industry impact was remarkably quick because it actually reduced death rates of, stag of stags, especially over winter. So this is some of the stuff that actually, by working very closely with the industry, I learned a huge amount in that period. The next thing I'll talk about is about deer and about the variety of cervids. And this is an example of a, um, this is a Pierre David Red there we uh, produced at Invermay, one of several hundred. Um, and that's a, a picture at Invermay, it's a, a, the progeny of a Pierre David, uh, Pierre David sire over a red deer female. Red deer in the middle, and then the last picture of that of Wapiti, or North, North American elk, um, which obviously there were some, in, there were some uh, had hybridised with red deer in Fiordland, and then numbers were imported later. There's a variety of cervids. The important thing about these is they have this extraordinary ability to hybridise. And so if you look at them, um, you've got them uh, right through from um, I don't know if this works or not, doesn't it? No. right through from the very smallest seeker in Japan, right through to the massive North American elk, and they all hybridize. These all these cervids hybridize. And they also hybridize with Pier David's deer. And then down the bottom you've got Samba and Rusa, which are tropical species, and they hybridize with each other and will also hybridize with the others, but the fertility is much lower. So why was this interest in this ability to hybridise? Actually, it was driven completely by interest in, by the practical potential of these animals in the industry. And the first, the size and growth and the potential for terminals um, was the, what led to the Wapiti, uh, Wapiti uh, uh, hybridisation. And then seasonality was the attraction of Pierre Davids, and this was again driven by the industry, was really around whether they could bring, modify the breeding season in, in red deer by introducing Pierre David, who curiously are uh, very closely related, but are long day breeders as distinct from red deer, which are short day, short day breeders. And then scientifically, the interspecies hybrids, both sexes are fertile, and that meant that they could be used as a genetic mapping resource in ruminants. What actually happened? Well, the size and growth potential for Wapitis, for Wapiti has been hugely, hugely uh, successful. And that's um, now, it's not just Wapiti, it's the other European crosses of uh, deer as well. But that's been hugely successful and is a core part of the industry now. Seasonality, um, uh, the, the Pier David's long day breeders, complete failure. And part of the reason for his failure is because they themselves were highly inbred and they, they didn't live, very, a lot of them died from, um, a, um, from a viral disease. So that was why they failed. So what did I learn I think in all this career is the scale and the power of biological variation and a lot about evolution and thinking a lot about evolution and how that really plays into what we are, what we are doing with our work in uh, animals and plants and our systems. So what are my learnings? A couple of learnings that I think are reflected in these two sayings. One by Charles Darwin, the last sentence of origin. Uh, from, uh, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. And another quote from Benoit Mandelbrot, uh, who's a mathematician, um, for those of you who know about, it's the guy who pioneered the thinking about fractals. 
Uh, bottomless wonders stem from simple rules repeated without end. And to me, a really good example of this is how, how vast species, numbers of species, from insects right through to mammals, uh, are having trained themselves on day length and on circadian rhythms and circannual rhythms. So that's a really good example of a, of a common, a common uh, tie-up across all of biology. Now to abacus, which has been a core part of my life for the last 20 odd years. Um, uh, we founded abacus really to bridge science and business because I saw a gap. I saw a gap that the science was becoming more science, if you like, and the applications was getting further apart, and it was inevitable really, that the science was getting more sciencey. So we had to work, so I could see a gap. And I started to see the gap when I was at Invermay. And then, after a few years, a couple of years, three years consulting on my own, I realised there was a, that we had to do something that I thought we could do something about it. So we set up Abacus Bio. And it's a very strong technical basis with a very applied focus. So our clients are everywhere from companies to farmers to breeders to investors in R&D to R&D organisations and from the farmer through to the processor. And um, we work in a variety of areas, but that practical applications and the value of bringing people together in a team that has really thrived. So, so Abacus Bios are now about, I don't know, 50 to 60 people internationally, and we really have de uh, developed um, some well-known uh, expertise around, I would call it technical, strategic, practical. Breeding and genetics, we're known for, especially internationally, in livestock, plants, fish, insects, whatever, really. And then a lot of work in biological processes. Having that underpinning understanding of biological processes, I think, has been incredibly valuable in terms of how we think and how we do stuff. And the diversity of thought among the, among the group, I think, is really important. The other thing we do is we put a huge amount of money and time into training and into bringing young people. We run a big intern program. We have 10 interns a year, um, which are people learning about, um, usually from a science background, actually, and they get introduced to the agri-food business sector, which is, to me, incredibly important. And so integration into farming and agri-food systems internationally, I think, is how we think and how we've really built our business. I'm going to highlight three areas of my my commercial experience, I suppose, in learnings about stuff. One is we can easily get confused. So coming back to the core of the issue is always fundamental. Asking the question, what can make a difference on farm? And we can forget. And one of the things I find very uh, humbling is in a conference like this is to talk to people, farmers and that sort of stuff, who remember stuff that I've forgotten which is, I think, really uh, humbling and learning. We can easily get confused. What we need is actionable knowledge. Sometimes we get confused between data, information, and knowledge. So that confusion rarely is a problem. So we have to distinguish what on earth we're generating. So to me, focusing back on actionable knowledge, and one of the things we teach, we talked a lot to our young people about is having a clarity of purpose when they, when they come up with what, they want to, what they're going to be doing, work they're working on. What's the real clarity of what they're there for? Because our outcome, what we need, is actionable knowledge. The other is a way to it. I'm going to talk about three aspects in relation to um, making stuff happen. Uh, sheep productivity, effecting change and things that work, and I'll conclude with a little bit about methane. Productivity. As Trisha Johnson said yesterday, this productivity stuff's very well known. This is the productivity per U in the industry has doubled over about the last 30, to, since, about, since the late 80s actually. Um, more than doubled. And the feed per kilogram of meat sold dropped by about 35%. And why has this actually happened? This is a spectacular rate of comp this is a spectacular compound annual growth rate. So why has it happened? And a few years ago, we did some work for MPI, um, showing, and we estimated, work, able to work out that a little more than but, but half or more of this was due to genetics. The rest of it was due to management 
and pastures and that sort of stuff. But about half, more, half or more was due to genetic gain in the sheep industry, which is pretty spectacular. And to put it in perspective, the number of lambs uh, reared per ewe went from just under 180 late mid 80s to over 130 um, in the um, well, over, well over 130 now. And carcass weight in the same period, average carcass weight's gone from about 12 and a half to about closer to 19 to 20. Now change requires uptake. And this to me is where genetics comes in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about genetics. In genetics, there are three basic tools at work. And they're all different and they're best used together. There's a difference between breeds, which was recognised by the, the early pioneers in producing the Coopworth. How do you capitalise on that difference? How do you capitalise on things that, that work? There's selection within breeds once you've got something started. The next one is crossing between breeds, and you've got two types of that. One that's led to the composite in the case of the, um, the, uh, the, the maternal ewe, and also in the case of the dairy cow, the, the uh, Jersey Friesian cross. The, the Kiwi Cross. Two really brilliant examples of how to capitalise on the difference between breeds and then come up with something practical that make, can make a real difference. And then putting on top of that selection. And then all together with this, you've got the capacity of terminal size to add, add more productivity to the system. So where's the money in improving livestock productivity? The way I look at it and the way I talk about it is that genetics enable, enables, it sets the limits. Without that genetic capacity, you're not going to get there. Um, and management delivers. It says how much you can actually get. I think that distinction is very, really important and incredibly important to understand that one that they must work together in tandem. This is genetics in action. Those of you who appreciate it, um, that, that mare, as it turned out to be, the, she holds the record at Rickerton for 1,000 metres and, um, and she, ho she holds the two highest times ever at record in 1,000 metres from about 20 years ago. And we bought her, um, we bought her um, and um, she turned out to be a bit of a sensation. And, um, but a lot of, she had a lot of problems. That taught me a lot about inbreeding issues. In, there are inbreeding problems in thoroughbreds because they're highly inbred. And there's also the environmental things. Little things go wrong. They hurt their legs. They trip up. So things go, things go wrong. But you learn a lot about uh, this, the genetics sets the, sets the enables, it sets the limits. It's how you then manage it is, is so fundamental. Now getting on to what things work on farm. What can make a difference on farm? Where's the value proposition for the farmer? Um, to me, the way I look at it, it's the right technology and the way we're looking at it in Abacus now and some of our stuff, it, that's profitable within the farming system. So it's a value proposition based approach. So we take the, it has to be profitable within the system. So right technology in the farming system. It's simple to understand, simple to implement, readily scalable within the business and readily transferable between the business, between businesses. So I'm going to give you an example now of scoring the value proposition by effectively going to a source of better rams. This is a 25er. It's a 25-pointer. It really hits the button on every one of them. We know that better rams, that getting a better ram breed of better rams is profitable. It's simple to understand farmers already buy rams. It's simple to implement. You can buy, you, can, you, get, you buy rams. It's readily scalable. You can buy one ram, five rams, or 10 rams. It's readily transferable. The bloke next door can see what you've done and do the same thing. So it's a 25-pointer. It's, really it's a very useful way of looking at what might be successful on farm. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the future, the big issues, climate change and global warming, but only going to talk, we've only got time to talk about uh, one aspect of that, namely methane. If we're going to reduce methane, we'd like or we'd need to capture some of the saved energy. The key is farmer uptake. But I think we still need a, re a robust, commercially relevant measurement system so that farmers can relate to what they're actually doing. And the core of all of this is where's the value proposition? We can do all the research 
around, and this is the research that's absolutely critical to going on at the moment, changing the host for genetics, changing the rumen ecology with additives and diets, targeting the methane pathway with things like additives, targeting methane producers with vaccines, and capturing the energy and utilising the hydrogen. But it will go nowhere unless there's a really clear value proposition for farmers to take it up. We have to think about what that value proposition is and how we make it practical for farmers to take up. So I'm just going to take one example to go back to our theme of scoring the value proposition. This is to score the value proposition in our four additives in, a, in the dairy industry. And at the heart of it, is it profitable? We actually don't know at this point. We've got to come up with how it can be a profitable, profitable system going forward. It's really simple to understand, for probably a four out of five. It's simple to implement as long as you've got an in-shared feeding system. It's readily scalable. You can put it in one, two, five, three sheds if you've got them all. Um, and it's readily scalable. It's re so it's readily scalable as long as you've got an in-shared in, an in feeding system. And it's readily transferable. The bloke next door can see what you've done. In looking at all these technologies, I think it's very valuable to go back and look at things we might have forgotten. When I was a student in the, in the late 60s, there was a huge amount of interest in methane, not because, of its metha not because of its global warming effect, but because it was seen as a massive loss of energy. It gave us a massive, a very great foundation and understanding in those days, really some understanding about methane. Um, but one little aspect um, from some work that's 20 years old now, um, that just reminded me the other day of sometimes we forget things. Um, this is some work in New Zealand looking at um, New Zealand Frisians versus Holstein Frisians, looking at the methane yield, which is the parameter that's being used, different between New Zealand Frisians, Holstein Frisians, both on pasture in this case. And, but the important thing to me is there's a seasonal interaction here. It's cows on pasture. If you look at New Zealand Frisians in, in, on spring pasture, uh, uh, 18, um, the yield about 18, lower than the average, but Holstein Frisians on the same pasture, lower again. And then in, um, in day 150, where the pasture's starting to, it's a bit different, it's getting into, into summer, um, you've then still got a difference. Into autumn, no difference. It, there may well be some, some stage of lactation effects here, we don't really know. But the important point is these interactions are really important in understanding when you're actually starting to measure things and try to, to um, be aware of them when you start to look at breeding and selection experiments. So now, I suppose, as I conclude, it's your turn. How can we make a difference? There's no shortage of opportunity. Going back to my three themes of curiosity, applications and people. Curiosity. Be curious, ask questions, read widely, think, challenge, test your ideas. Frankly, ideas are easy. It's not that difficult. It's actually how you put them into practice, which is the real, really important thing. Which brings me to applications, to focus on issues and problems, ensure a real clarity of purpose, and I can't emphasize that enough. Think about how it will work in a system, and where's the value proposition on farm? Why would a farmer want to do that? And then work with people who are interested in solutions. And diversity of thinking and approaches works. In Abacus, I think we've got about 18 nationalities, and we've got a vast range of backgrounds of people. And it all just adds to the, to the melting pot of ideas and thinking, and actually focused on what the customer, our client, is trying to get from us, real that clarity of what they want. So, in summary, curiosity, applications, people. And I suppose two learnings that I've got out of this lot in applications. A great quote from Ernest Rutherford, and it's, it's been, there's lots of different versions of this quote, but we don't have much money, therefore we must think. So to me, it's so, it's really, we've never got enough money. And the other one is Clayton Christensen, uh, 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 business guy out of Harvard, the late Creighton Christensen, who I think really um, got me thinking about innovation. He says, when we buy a product, we hire Americanism. We hire something to get a job done. The reason we, do, we, we, get, we buy a tractor or whatever we buy or a new ram, we want it 
They're there for a purpose. So really focusing on what the purpose is, is to get the job done. It's not, generally speaking, the actual product itself. It's, to get the, it's the outcome we want. So in summary, my learnings in animals, they can't talk, so we have to listen very carefully. From so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. And when we buy a product, we hire something to get a job done. And we, and we said we haven't got the money, so we'll have to think. And bottomless wonders stem from simple rules without end. Thank you to the NZGA and, and NZSAP. Thank you. Peter, we have a small uh, memento of this occasion. So, um, and perhaps um, if we, should we just go down here and yeah. we'll, we'll let Alan take a photograph of this. <laughs>